The Tinder Swindler is one of Netflix's most watched documentaries. It chronicles the unbelievable story of a guy named Simon who scammed hundreds of thousands of dollars from women. I had the privilege of sitting down with Eileen Charlotte, who dated and managed to get revenge on the Tinder swindler himself. Eileen is an absolute powerhouse. She is smart. She's from a working class family. She saved up her hard earned money only to have it stolen by someone who claimed to love her. Despite facing such adversity, she never wavered. She remained cool, calm, collected. I remember thinking, I wish I was as tough as this woman. I'm actually a little jealous. There's nothing more pleasurable than watching a scammer get outplayed. And Eileen checkmated that fool. I hope you enjoy my conversation with her as much as I did. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. The worst part is that he can only be guilty for stealing the money from me. Correct. But he cannot be guilty for the mental part he did. No. And that's even way worse than the money he took. In this episode, we are going to hear the story of Eileen Charlotte. Who knew that swiping right could cause such a world of hurt? Now, lots of people have had bad match stories on Tinder, but this is a whole different level. The Tinder swindler managed to steal millions of dollars from multiple women from around the world, most of whom fell for his charm, charisma, love bombing, false promises, and ultimately his scam. Eileen Charlotte was one of the women who got caught up in the twisted story of Simon, the Tinder swindler. Simon posted a lavish lifestyle on Instagram and Tinder, a well-traveled, attractive, and fun-loving guy, and he matched with Eileen. In the months to follow, Eileen found herself falling in love with Simon. They moved in and planned a future together. At the same time, though, he kept pressuring her for money, claiming that he was in danger because of his business and had to hide from people who were coming after him. Eileen ended up loaning him over $140,000, which he had promised to pay back, and she almost lost her home. He left her feeling that her own life and her family's lives were at risk. Eileen's story is the cautionary tale of a fairy tale gone dark. Her story is no different than that of many young women like so many others. She's ambitious with a zest for life and she was just simply looking for love. The Netflix documentary, The Tinder Swindler, made waves around the world and changed Eileen's life overnight. The Tinder Swindler is not just a story of an online scammer. It's a story about narcissism. This story teaches us that when you combine the manipulative ingredients of narcissism with the hope of a love story, you end up with a broken heart and an empty bank account. Eileen is here to tell this story and how she, in her fashion, triumphed in the end. We are going to break down love bombing and the overall architecture of the narcissistic relationship, as well as her path of healing from not just the financial debt, but the emotional debt. Instead of glorifying the grifter, this is the story of the survivor. So welcome, Eileen. It's so nice to have you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me as well. Of course. Eileen, so could you break down for us, aside from the sort of surface level things 
What attracted you to him and led you to fall in love? Uh, He was very interested in me on a personal level, what I was doing, my friends, my family, the way I lived. And it immediately created a bond because he had a different lifestyle. But still, we we had a great connection because he was still like a down-to-earth guy who was also looking for love. And that's what made me really attracted to him. That is such an important thing to note. When it came down to it, what I'm hearing is that it was really that he was deeply interested in you. We all know that charm and charisma and confidence can often attract us to someone, but we can't underestimate curiosity. Simon was interested in Eileen's life and wanted to learn about her. Charisma may be dazzling, but intense curiosity can be seductive in a way that leaves a person not even thinking about red flags. I was traveling a lot for work and he always came to visit me. For example, when I was in Barcelona for a work trip or when I was in London for a work trip, he came to visit me, which is also very special because someone is just flying over the earth because he's so busy and still he made some time for me to see me and to meet me. So that also made me feel and made me fall in love with him because, yeah, it really felt that he was interested in me and not my looks or I don't know. (laughs) So I'm sure it was all of them, right? You know, it was all of that. He was interested in you. But coming back to that point, though, the way the story has been told is that it was all very flashy and exciting. But what he was bringing to the table really was that he was interested in you and you were interested in him and he was very attentive. And I think that we underestimate how important that is, no matter what a person brings to the table, gifts, experiences, whatever. It's that really focused attention, interest that somebody has in us that's really, really appealing. So that's a universal theme, right? Yes. Yes, of course. And it doesn't matter where you are with a person, because, for example, I also had a small dinner in a small Italian restaurant and we were just eating pizza. So it wasn't all flashy like it's been described in a documentary as well. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell us about how it was when the two of you moved in together? It was really nice in the beginning. We had a lot of fun and I could finally like really be together with him. And because sometimes when you're traveling a lot, He was over there. I was over there. So sometimes it was really difficult to see each other. But now he was actually there all the time. And did you find yourself growing closer to him at this time? Or were there any issues that came up? He built up the story about his enemies and Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. he got attacked. Like we also seen in the movie that he and his bodyguard were attacked and he created this story about the enemies who want him dead and he needed to live a little bit undetected. Mm -hmm. So that's why he moved in with me because, yeah, everything was under my name and nothing was under his name. He was also starting to use my money. So, yeah, those were the difficulties I needed to face. But he made his company sent me a check to cover all the money he, um, Mm -hmm. he was using from me. So I thought everything was fine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You, of course you did, right? I mean, that's a, why wouldn't you, right? It's right there. It's right there in black and white. There's a check. We talk about these red flags as though they are so obvious, like these big neon signs that anyone can see. In retrospect, the idea that he had these enemies out for him feels outlandish. And her covering and paying the bills is suspicious. But narcissistic people are so skilled at taking bizarre and shady stuff and putting it together into what feels like a plausible narrative. And Eileen cared about him. So whenever we care about someone, we make the pieces fit. So let's go back and talk a little bit about love bombing, right? Because in this kind of a relationship, we see it every single time. And love bombing is a sort of really intense at times even overwhelming early phase of the relationship. Now it can look different in different kinds of relationships, right? But it basically is the early part of the relationship is characterized by something that almost feels like a fairy tale or a fantasy. It's that 
intense. It's that overwhelming. When you look back on this relationship with Simon, what parts or what experiences would you identify as the love bombing? In the beginning, because he started to ask money from me after almost seven months. Mm. But he was so generous in the months before. He was so open and he called me up every day and also Every time when I made a transaction to him, he was so sweet if I got the money. And he was bombing me and bombing me and bombing me with love. And I want to marry you. I want to have kids with you. I want to be with you. I want to grow old with you. But at some point when I, for example, didn't got the money or confronted him with like, what are you doing? I'm sending you all this money and it's never enough for you. Then he always got angry and mad. So as a woman in a relationship, you always want to go back to the part when it was nice. So you really hope to get the feeling again mm-hmm. yeah. of the love you had. Okay, so there's a lot we can unpack here. When a narcissistic person feels satisfied or safe in a relationship, they promise the sun and moon to a partner. They make future faked promises, things that they say will happen, but they never will. However, when the narcissistic person is tense or their needs aren't being met, that's when you see the rage and the manipulation. If you don't know what you are dealing with, This can be really confusing. How long would you say that that love bombing period lasted with Simon? I think it was the whole period of me having a relationship with him. Mm. It's difficult to describe because in the beginning, everything was good and he stayed sweet all the time because he needed something from me. It's interesting what you're describing here, Eileen, because when we think of it from the sort of framework of the more sort of toxic or narcissistic relationship, I'm so glad you brought this up because we often think of these as separate phases. There's love bombing and then things go wrong. But what was happening for you is something that happens a lot is the two are interlinked and he had an agenda, right? He wanted something from you. In this particular case, it was money. In another relationship, it could be something else. But in this case, it was money. So when he saw that all of his sort of charming, attentive behavior got him what he wanted, it got him the money he wanted to keep his scheme going, then he would almost relax. And in that relaxing, he would become very, very sweet. I want to marry you. I want to grow old with you. All these things that are very, were very seductive to hear. But any moment that you would have pushback, why do you need it so fast? Or why do you even need this much? Immediately you would see anger. So it's such an interesting way that this happened, Eileen, because you had both the love bombing and the devaluing phases happening at the same time. Yes. And you were pulled back to wanting that sort of idealized seductive time was almost there all the time. Like it was two masks. He was in essence wearing two masks. The aggressive, angry you know, sort of rageful mask when he didn't get what he wanted and this really seductive, loving, attentive mask when he got what he wanted. And that was the back and forth. How long until you connected that? Did you ever connect that? Oh, when I give him the money, he's a really nice guy. When I don't give him money, he becomes really aggressive. How long did it take you to figure that out? I think after a few months of giving him money and made several transactions to him, I found out that every time when... I didn't give him money, he got angry and he he always put the blame on me. And that's when I started to realize that it wasn't actually okay. Because in a relationship, there are two people. And if you like someone, you don't want to make them feel bad. And he may, every time when I, for example, couldn't send him the money or didn't send him the money, he really made me feel mm-hmm. bad that it was my fault that mm-hmm. everything would be blown mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Blame shifting is one of the most common narcissistic patterns. Narcissistic people cannot take responsibility, will not take responsibility, and anything that goes wrong is blamed on other people. Their grandiosity and their need to be all powerful means they cannot take ownership of mistakes because then that means they aren't all that. Blame shifting is a way for them to maintain their grandiose facade. 
And then I started to realize that there was something wrong. I can't imagine this happening, given how strong and resolute even I'm you know, noticing you to be in this conversation. Was there ever a moment you ever thought like, okay, if I keep giving him the money, then this relationship is going to run well? Or as soon as you recognized what was going on, you said, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Yes, because it's not fun, because he really makes you live in fear with his enemies and people who are hunting him. So he really makes you live in fear. And at a certain point, losing all the money and living in fear, I knew that I didn't want it anymore Mm -hmm. because this is not the love I prefer. Right. I mean, love and fear actually are not good flavors together. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. (laughs) To a greater or lesser degree, all narcissistic relationships are about fear. And the person in the narcissistic relationship lives in a constant cycle of trying to please them and never anger them. It can be an actual fear of their rage, or it can be a fear of having to really accept what this relationship is. So people just keep trying to please them until they can't. Eileen, how did he sell that story to you so that when he asked you for money, it didn't seem alarming? He always had projects, which he was calling and referring to as operations. And there was always a new operation to support, in a way, which he needed money for. Or he needed money for flight tickets and hotels and traveling. So those kind of things I mostly sponsored, in a way. When he would ask for the money, would you be able to say, can I have a little bit of time to think about this? No, that's the problem with these type of fraudsters. They don't make you think rationally. For example, Mm. if I would ask my friend for money, I can always say to her or him, like, I will give you two or three weeks to think about if it's okay or if it's not okay, just think about it. But with him, he would rather like to have it yesterday than tomorrow. <laughs> and then he he's bombing you and he's calling you all the time, constantly and constantly to push you so far that you don't even got the time to think about anything just to think rationally. Mm. And that's the biggest problem with these type of frauds, that you're in a state of mind and you want to help someone, but if they are really in need and they are shouting at you that they are in a very dangerous situation, yes, of course, you're going to arrange the money. What I'm hearing from you is that that sense of urgency and danger. If I don't get this money, he's telling you something terrible is going to happen, right? So you feel this empathy, but you also have this awareness, this is a lot of money. But how do you think all of that, that sense of this is dangerous, this has to happen quickly or something terrible is going to happen. How do you think that blocked you from seeing the red flags, seeing the deception? Everything went so fast. I cannot even call it a roller coaster, but I think I was in 25 roller coasters at that moment. (laughs) Yes. Every time there's a different story, every time there's a different operation, every time he's in need, there is something happened, a death threat, something which can maybe even affect me or my Mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And with these type of things, you really feel sorry for someone, but you also want to protect yourself as well. In a way, it seems like part of how he was sort of selling the story was he had images showing sort of past episodes of things that look like danger and violence. The story was somewhat believable, but then he really used that idea of time urgency to pressure you. It reminds me of people who are thinking of making a major purchase and the salesperson is pressuring them. If you don't buy it now, you're never going to get it. If you don't buy it now, the price is going to go away in half an hour. And that's not exactly the conditions under which to make a great decision. But it's not like you were trying to buy a car. You were in a relationship with somebody and being intensely pressured. When you would call him out on that intensity saying, you've got to slow down or this is too quick or I need to think about this, what would happen then? He got angry. You are ruining this. You are the one who is blowing everything up because I I need the money now. I cannot wait because then this will happen or this will happen or I will die or I will lose everything or you will lose me or I'm going to kill myself. And that one was like (laughs) the worst, of course, because you love someone. 
Right here. This is a great example of the escalated manipulation a narcissistic person will use in a relationship to get what they need or get what they feel entitled to. Each time you may try to set a boundary, they keep leveling up the terrible things that will happen if you don't give in to them. It became very manipulative, right? So you are being reasonable. You're asking something reasonable. I need a minute. I need to think about this. This is a lot of money. And the manipulation was, it sounded like he almost doubted your commitment to the relationship. Oh, you must not care very much about me if you have to think about it and I'm about to die. I think it's so easy for people to look at the story from the outside and said, I would have just said no. Yeah. But if you care about someone, and you truly believe this much harm is going to come, or they even say they're going to harm themselves, and your commitment is being doubted, you're so confused at that point to show your commitment, you then end up doing the thing that you're uncomfortable with. So in essence, he's playing with this idea of consent. You really weren't consenting to give the money. You were being coerced to give the money. And I yeah. think there's a diff- there's absolutely a difference. <laughs> Eileen, that's a really classical example of gaslighting. You know, people don't understand gaslighting. We always say, it's like, oh, that never happened. We keep it simple. But what he was doing was he was testing your commitment. And while in your heart, you were clearly committed, he was using that as a way to manipulate you. Yes. Oh, if you really cared about me, then you'd give me the money then. If you really wanted this relationship, you'd give me the money then. And you know I'm going to pay you back. And since he had a track record in the history of paying you back from time to time, it was believable. Yes, correct. Yeah, because he did pay me back sometimes. And also people don't understand because I think I did maybe over 25 transactions to him. And yes, he did pay me back sometimes. So you always have the feeling that it will be okay. There's no doubt because he already paid me back a few of those times. So it feels like love bombing for him, and this is the case with any kind of, you know, con man, is that it's an indoctrination period, like a grooming period, where they determine, is this going to be a a useful person to me? Can I get what I want from this person? That's what he was in probably the first few times he'd ask you for money to see if you'd say yes. He'd pay you back because for him, that was him testing the waters. And then once he could see that I'm able to sell her the idea that, oh, if you care for me, you give me the money, then he knew he had you. And then he yes. could keep that game going. And that that's every person who's like him, n- narcissistic in that way, they will always take advantage and weaponize the other person's empathy. It's the most classical dynamic. Once they see empathy, they don't see it as, oh, this is lovely. This is loving how fortunate I am. They say, ah, ha, ha. Here is a point. It's almost like a little crack in a window. Here's where I can break into this house and steal their things. It it has that feel to it. Yes, yes. And I think with narcissistic people, they only care about themselves. Because, for example, at the end of everything, I was in such a bad place. I was in debt. I lost all of my money. I almost lost my house. But even his problems were worse than mine. Of course. That ability for the narcissistic person to play the victim is a very classical element of that personality style. Yes. Their problems are always the worst problems. Always. And it's never them. It's always you. No, it's always someone else's fault. There's no capacity for taking that kind of responsibility. And it's interesting because you said it with someone narcissistic like him, it's always about them. It goes beyond that here. If a person's that selfish, it's always about them. That's unpleasant enough. But then in the process of everything being about them, they feel the need to destroy other people because there's absolutely no awareness that what they're doing is harming the other people. There's literally, it's actually quite unsettling to recognize that somebody was that unaware of the toll that they were taking on you, of the harm they were putting on you. Yeah, Absolutely. Because, for example, you you can see it as well in the documentary, like in the end, where I already knew that I got defrauded and I just wanted to play a bit with him. It was a bit of my revenge. You could see that I almost lost my house and I lost already over 140. Now it's up more, but a lot of money. And He felt bad for himself because he needed to sleep in a hostel. So in a way, he's always like an 
he's always putting it on me. And that was my fault. That was my mistake because I didn't send him any more money. And that, and that's how it's always, always framed. I want to go back to something we were talking about, this idea of how he used fear to motivate you to give him money. Something bad's going to happen to him or he would do something bad to himself or even something bad could happen to you or your family, right? So he really, really used fear. When somebody uses fear the way he did, right? Not only did you love him and care about him, so obviously you didn't want anything bad to happen to him, but as you would say, I need a moment, I need to think on this, he'd yell at you and scream at you. The thing I want to understand is, did you ever have a moment, Eileen, where you thought, I'm not sure, you know, if this is the right thing to give him the money, but if I'm wrong and something terrible happens to him, I'll feel bad for the rest of my life? Yes, of course. Because if someone is using enemies and life threats as a weapon, and you actually see, like from the movie as well, the pictures that he's sending you, that he got attacked. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's getting real. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The situation was real, and that's how he pretended to be. But uh, so you also know deep down that if something would happen to him that you can never regret yourself. Narcissistic relationships are like a series of bets you make. If I do that, then they do that, and then I will stay. The relationship is a series of perpetual tests and deals with the devil. I wondered, Eileen, as I've learned about your story, as I'm talking to you, is that there's this strange point you hit where having to live in fear that maybe you did the wrong thing would actually be worse than losing the money. Yes, absolutely. Because in a way, you can always say like, oh, it's just money. But if his life is on the line, then mm -hmm. it's a human being. It's a life. And that's where his manipulation was so powerful, right? Because you really had to sit with that possibility of regret Nobody likes that. That's a real a huge fear for people is regret. What if I do the wrong thing? And as you said, it's in the grand scheme of things, especially when you love somebody, it's only money. And if this stops him from getting hurt, he really had you convinced that as long as you give me this money, I can be protected. And so you wouldn't have to live again with that regret. So that was a deeply, deeply manipulative thing for him to do. Yes. It was obviously a sort of a technique he had used with many people and he saw that it worked. He took advantage of the empathy. He took advantage of the love. He'd know that nobody wants to be responsible for harm or death of another person. He'd use that to extract the money from a person. And then when things didn't happen fast enough, he'd start yelling and screaming, knowing that that kind of rage is also frightening for people. Yes, yes, absolutely. My session with Eileen will continue after this break. So let's talk about something called trauma bonding. It's how a person gets stuck in a really toxic relationship cycle. A central issue in the trauma bonded relationship is that a person is in a relationship that keeps going from great to bad to great to bad arguing to happy, arguing to great day. And that back and forth is what keeps a person stuck yes. because they keep waiting for the next good day. Yes. And even when there's five bad days, six bad days, there's enough good days to say, well, I'm really going to hold out for the good day now. It's almost, you know, when you go to a casino and you play that machine, you pull the handle, you put in the money and, you know, sometimes you get yeah. the money prize. <laughs> it's like that because, and even if 10 times you put in the money, nothing comes out then you think, okay, maybe this time I'm going to get so much money. Maybe there's going to be a good yeah. day. I think it's just so important to reflect on that trauma-bonded idea. So what we're seeing here, because this pattern between Eileen and Simon was both trauma-bonded, but also kind of quite simple, it makes it even more difficult. If he got the money when and how he wanted it, they had a great day. He told her he loved her. He made big promises. If he didn't get the money, it was all anger and rage and threats. That back and forth, that promise of a good day is what keeps people stuck 
in toxic relationships. Just for a brief moment, Eileen, what was your, in, when you were growing up in childhood, what was your family life like? Like, what was your parents' marriage like? My parents' marriage was uh, really great. They, I grew up in a very loving family. I That's am an only child. And my parents are already together for over 50 years now. Wow, wow. That's okay. <laughs> so now you just throw me a curveball, girl, because yes. I'll tell you why. This is why your story is so amazing, Eileen. I mean, I think, I think the story has sort of been mistold. I forgot, oh, she gave her money away. But there's so much power to your story because here you were, you grew up, you kind of defy the stereotype, right? We always think, oh, the person who's going to fall for someone like Simon is going to have a terrible childhood. and Their parents had a terrible marriage and they had a yeah. terrible father. So they go with this bad guy. You're saying that's not it at all, right? Your parents no. had a loving marriage for that's lasted a long time. Because it's a loving marriage, you felt loved as a child. So you yes. actually believed in love. And yes. Right? Yeah. Am I so the trauma bonding for you was interesting because we often think of it as historical in a person's life. They had this sort of difficult relationship with their parents, so they reproduce, recreate that relationship in adulthood. That wasn't your story. No. Yours was you believed in love. Yes. And I was looking for love as well. And I'm still looking for love. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But what is not really told well in the documentary is eight years ago now, I mm-hmm. um, I was in a very terrible accident. I got robbed oh. by two guys and beaten up very bad. So sorry. Yeah. And I got PTSD from that. And the worst thing of the situation with Simon is that he triggered back the PTSD, because he knew about it. He knew that I was scared to be followed. He knew that I was scared to be alone in the streets at night. And he used that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to trigger back the PTSD. And in a way, because the PTSD got back, he put me in a sort of state of mind, which it's not you. Because for example, if I look back on all the WhatsApp messages right now, three years, four years later, I feel so stupid. But back then I was in a state of mind, which it wasn't me. And especially because he brought back the PTSD, for example, he knew Mm -hmm. that I was scared to be followed. And every time when I saw someone behind me, I was always a bit nervous when someone was behind me very close. And at a certain point, he was living at my house and we were driving home and we came into the street of my house. And he said, please check every car, please check please drive three rounds through the street to check if we're not followed. And with those type of things, he brought back the PTSD. And I think that's the worst thing he did to me. First of all, I'm so sorry. Thank you, know, thank you for, for sharing that story because you, you bring up something so important here, Eileen, which is you had had this, this, this history of trauma, right? Yes. And that this kind of a toxic relationship, narcissistic relationship, can actually reactivate all of that. So like you may have worked through that trauma, but trauma is a funny thing. It sits in our bodies. It sits in our minds. It's still there. And it can be reactivated, right? It's always, it's all, and in some ways it always is going to be there. But as you get away from this kind of a toxic experience, you might feel like you have more tools to cope with it. So Eileen's talking about trauma here, and I want to go deeper into this. Post-traumatic discomfort can be activated when we experience anything that was similar to earlier and past traumas we've experienced. In Eileen's case, being followed or being reminded of being followed really brought up those old traumatic experiences for her. When that traumatic experience is triggered, any of us would feel anxious, on edge, and even panicky. And the horror of severe narcissistic relationships is that they have no problem using your own trauma as a tool of manipulation to get what they want. When somebody is invalidating you and manipulating you and more than anything, leaving you feeling scared, 
all of that is going to come back in a flood. If you talk to any trauma survivor, that could have happened to them 20 years ago. And they could be having an experience now and saying, I'm feeling all of this familiar stuff. Like, I don't even feel like I'm myself now. What's so awful and terrible to hear about in your story is that not only did he weaponize your empathy, you're a loving person, you cared about him, you didn't want him to suffer, you gave him your money. The part to me that's beyond unforgivable yeah. is that he weaponized your own history of trauma. Yes. And that to me is such a horrible thing to do to a person because it really becomes such a place you know you can control them. And this goes back to this, we don't have to think about love bombing in a different way. As he got to know you and learned about you and was so interested in you, that's how he learned about your history. Yes. And learning those things about your history, he thought, ah, I can actually get a response. I can get what I want if I bring up this part of her past. Yes. And he used that to throw you off balance and make you more manipulatable. Interestingly, Eileen, that's not a crime, but in the psychological court I live in, you better believe that feels like a crime to me. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And the worst part is that he can only be guilty for stealing the money from me. Correct. But he cannot be guilty for the mental part he did. And no. that's even way worse than the money he took. So in this next session, Eileen, we're going to talk a little bit about how you found him out, basically how you figured it out. So tell us, because this is, I mean, like I said, you are you are a rock star in my eyes. I will tell you, I watched the show, I was like, ooh, this girl has got it going on. You are more courageous than I, and I, I say that with the yeah. utmost in respect. Clever, courageous, and I really want you to share with us about how you found out about who he really was and how that led you to put all of the pieces together. Yes, well, thank you so much for the compliment because it's the best thing that I can hear from my action. <laughs> I was at the airport in Prague where I was actually with him and he just dropped me off at the airport and I opened up my Instagram and I saw his face coming up on my feed and I clicked mm -hmm. on it. And there I saw this whole article from a Norwegian newspaper with two girls in it, better known as Nila and Cecily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were talking about Simon and his um, actions, what he did to them. He defrauded them for a lot of money. And while I was reading the article, I immediately knew. Wow, wow, wow. Because everything was so similar to my story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I immediately knew that the story, what the girls put out there, was true. Mm -hmm. And still, I don't know what I was thinking because I was still in contact with Simon and he just dropped me off. So he started calling me and I sent it over. I sent over the article and I said, what's this? Mm -hmm. Because I just read it on Instagram. And then first he started to scream at me like, how did you get this? Mm -hmm. And I was just, it just popped up on my Instagram and then he said, no, it's not true. My enemies are paying these girls. Mm, of course. And then I started to realize immediately that his enemies were the girls. <laughs> exactly. And the people who he defrauded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when the ball started rolling. And ah. I started to contacting people under a false identity to see, because yes, he made me scared of my life as well. He knew where I lived. Mm -hmm. He knew where my parents lived. He knew where I worked. So in a way, I was still scared of my life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I needed to have like some sort of truth and more proof that he was a fraud. So I started to contact people. And after I knew, I went to the police and then the police said, we cannot do anything for you right now. And I was in a very difficult situation because I lost so much money. So here's a chance to go deep on gaslighting. The most surefire way to break through gaslighting is when other people see what we see or experience what we experience. 
even in the classical film Gaslight, what saves her is one other person seeing what she is going through and helping her feel less insane. Once Eileen was able to start putting the puzzle pieces together and recognize that she wasn't alone, she was able to take action and save herself. People in narcissistic relationships can easily become isolated and stuck in the narcissist's version of reality, and that can be dangerous. So I made him a suggestion, and I said, well, I don't have any more money anymore, but maybe you can give me your clothes. Because I knew every time when I was with him, he was wearing the newest collections mm. of all the yeah. big brands, like Gucci, Versace, Dolce & Gabbana. And every time it was like the latest collection, and I couldn't figure it out why that was. But then I understood that all of these things he bought with my money. Yeah, it's exactly right. It's yours. Yeah, so <laughs> basically, yeah, it was mine. Everything what he was wearing was from me. Mm -hmm. I suggested him to give the clothes to me because he was still in hiding and he wanted to be undetected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then I said, I can sell your clothes for you. And that's what I did. <laughs> oh, good for you. Well, I didn't sell it for him. Right. Well, you got the money. Now, I want to come back to how you kept getting revenge on him. But before I get to that, when, Eileen, did you start identifying Simon's patterns as narcissistic? How long did it take you to get there? I think when I really actually saw a pattern mm -hmm. was... When I had the clothes in my house and I didn't send him the money, that was the moment when I saw the back and forth between his personalities. That's so interesting because you know what's fascinating? And again, such a classical part of these stories is people say, Dr. Ravani, tell me how I can identify a narcissist right away. And I'll say, oh, it's going to take a minute. <laughs> For you, it took almost the entire course of the relationship then when it was clear, it was clear and you couldn't unsee it, but it takes a minute, right? If somebody's being charming and interested and interesting and nice and, and all of these things, you're not sort of going through your head saying, well, let me look for the narcissistic patterns. You're saying, I'm in front of a nice person. And despite even the back and forth and the money and the confusion, it was only then when you had the clothes and you really saw very quickly how he flipped between yes. the good Simon, bad Simon, good Simon, bad Simon, that it became clear. And I think it's important for people to know that sometimes the stuff, even with somebody who is as big as a scammer and a manipulator as he is, it took a minute to figure that out. And a lot of people say, why didn't I see it sooner? Why didn't I see it sooner? And they get angry at themselves because it takes a minute. Yes. Just so people could be kinder to themselves. It's important to know that. When I found out that he was a fraud, I think it took me like one and a half week to actually land and know that the fraud was real. Mm -hmm. But to see the patterns of his narcissistic personalities, that took me a bit longer, yeah. You know, what's interesting though, Eileen, is that you did get some justice. You know, even though he only did five months of a longer sentence, there was some justice, right? Yes. Most people who go through narcissistic relationships get no justice, right? The person just goes to, gets to go off and go off into the sunset. And really, that's actually everybody who ever came before you in Simon's life had that experience of no justice. I think we could maybe make an argument that this is maybe a half justice, <laughs> right? Because you're still carrying the wounds and the pain of having gone through that kind of manipulation and psychological abuse. Yes, absolutely. I will never get the justice for the mental part. The only thing what I can do is make the best out of it mm -hmm. and uh, be as strong as I am and uh, just move forward and just move along as well and to get over it. <laughs> I think what's amazing is that, you know, you shared your own trauma history, how he pretty much used that trauma history against you to draw more money out of you to, because he created such a sense of fear. That's why I really want to speak up because I know that a lot of women, but also men, of course, in these type of situations, in these type of relationships, if they don't see a way out, it can be so much worse because there are a lot of people who don't want to speak up, who don't want to tell their friends or don't want to tell their family. When you are in these type of situations, a lot of people 
will isolate themselves mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because of the shame, because of the hurt as well. Absolutely. And the moment you get isolated, it will only get worse because yeah. then you are still alone with your thoughts. No one is around you to help you, to support you, to be there for you. And that's why I really want to speak up because I think that it's important to tell, get like maybe one or two people in your friends or maybe family where you are going to tell your story because yeah. mm-hmm. without any people around you, you cannot survive. Narcissistic abuse thrives in isolation. Many survivors become isolated by shame, fear, and by the narcissist themselves. Hearing these stories and sharing these stories is the only way for survivors to break through this shame and recognize that talking about it is a key to surviving these relationships. Did you ever ask your family or friends for help? Yes. The moment when I found out, I immediately talked to my mother Mm -hmm. and I went to see some of my friends, Mm -hmm. a few of them, and I told them my story. And from that moment on, they were so supportive because I was isolating myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't go Mm -hmm. out for dinner because I didn't have any money. I didn't go to birthday parties because I couldn't afford a gift. I didn't do that already for more than a year because I couldn't afford it. Wow. Yeah. So I also had the feeling that I had to tell them because I didn't want to lie to them anymore because it felt Mm -hmm. like a lie. Mm -hmm. Every time I needed to make up excuses for not going somewhere. And that hurted me the most because I was lying to the people who do love me. Right. It's like, you know, you feel like you're being punished twice. Not only did you go through the relationship, but now you don't even feel you can be open and honest with the people you care about. So I think it's incredibly important to push back through that shame. You didn't do anything wrong. We will be right back with this conversation with Eileen. You know, again, Eileen, your story, it played out throughout the world. The world had so many reactions to it. As me, as a person who studies narcissistic abuse, who works with survivors of it, I see it as stories of narcissistic abuse aren't as simple as we'd like. You came from a very happy family. You simply believed in love. Somebody took advantage not only of your empathy, but your trauma. However, so many times we think of survivors of narcissistic abuse as very passive. And you showed how actually active and how much of an agent in your own destiny that you really, really were to this day and in your own healing. So what's next for you? It's so important for people to hear that no matter how bad a story someone goes through, there's something to be learned and there's often something to be paid forward to other people. I am talking to publishers right now to write a book. That's great. Because I really think that... My experience, again, can help people Absolutely. to get out. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, and what do I want to do more? Because I cannot sit still. <laughs> and then I thought, what do I really like? And that's drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And so you're building a business around that? Yes. I'm starting to create my own wine brand. Oh, great. I hope it has the words of survivor or fighter or something like that in there. Because I, I have to say, though, many times as a person comes through a survivorship story and recognizes that they came out the other side, that's when you realize it's time for me to start enacting my dreams. Yes. Because if I could come through that and still retain my sense of who I am, then the sky is the limit. And I have no doubt love will come flowing into your life because I think for many people, once they get themselves to such a good place in themselves and wiser from going through one of these relationships, you're actually in a magnificent position to welcome healthy love into your life, but also be able to call those red flags out early and say, yeah, no, you might have been nice to me, but you yelled at me and yelling at me is just not going to work. Bye. Yes, absolutely. I already experienced it in the past three years because, yes, I am dating. Ah, But now if it doesn't feel good, I'm just the first thing I would say is bye. (laughs) 
good for you. Yeah, and unfortunately, I had to go through this to see it now. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Correct. My hope is though people will see your story. And for some people, they'll see your story and that'll be enough to stop them from yes. actually feeling that they have to give in the first place and say, oh, actually, I can set a boundary because now it's very clear to me that even with someone incredibly wise and smart like yourself, that this can happen. So I think yes. that's where these stories become really important to share. Yes, absolutely. And also the word just came out, but the CEO, the real CEO of LLD Diamonds, Chagit Levayev, the daughter of Lev Levayev, she has reached out to us after the documentary mm -hmm. came out and we started up a collaboration together And we're going to release a bracelet. Oh, wow. Yes. There are two small rings coming together. And uh -huh. the bracelet is called Stronger Together because oh. as a group, we are stronger together. I love. There are two small diamonds in it as well. I love that idea of Stronger Together. And get some diamonds in there to sort of stick it to the Diamond King or yes. the King of Diamonds. Because really, you're the Queen of Diamonds, my dear. What's so striking to me about how Eileen's story was told was that it actually ended up with the world trying to find ways to demonize her and the other women who were harmed by Simon. People were characterizing them as gold diggers or foolish or naive. This was a big public story, but the kinds of things that happened to Eileen happened to people in narcissistic relationships all the time. People say to them things like, didn't you see this coming? Or... Why didn't you just leave? Or there's two sides to every story. When we invalidate the survivors of these stories, we give the narcissists a free pass. And then it emboldens other toxic people and leaves the people harmed by these relationships less likely to seek out help or talk about what happened. We have to stop glorifying the narcissists. I know that everyone might like to think that they would be too smart to fall for a grifter like Simon, but I have to tell you, while most of the people I work with won't get their stories on TV, all narcissistic relationships are a hustle. And if you think you aren't vulnerable, then you may be the most vulnerable one of all. Be careful. That was a great conversation with Eileen. And here's some takeaways based on the many things that we talked about. First, Narcissistic and toxic people really do use urgency and time to force you to make uncomfortable choices. And if you hesitate, they frame it as you not caring or being committed. Just like when someone is trying to sell you something or make a bad deal in a rush, when there is this sense of urgency, that should be a sign to slow down. And if they decide to leave the relationship, then it was probably a hustle. The best prevention and survival tool in gaslighted and narcissistic relationships is to avoid getting isolated. That can be hard to do, but cultivate friendships and other close relationships so you have another glimpse into reality. As Eileen said, without any people around you, you cannot survive. As our third takeaway today, gotta remember, that narcissistic relationships really are a process of indoctrination. There are enough good days and things that make sense in the relationship that we keep getting pulled in. Listen, nobody asks you for money on your first date. It takes a minute to identify these patterns. And that's why it's so important in any relationship that you take your time, journal any red flags that you observe, And the first time the relationship really feels uncomfortable, wait a minute and talk it out with people that you trust. Thank you so much for listening. Lastly, make sure you subscribe on iHeartRadio and please rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts. This show was produced by executive producers Jada Pinkett Smith, Fallon Jethro, Ellen Rakuten, and Dr. Romani Dervasala. Also, producer Matthew Jones, associate producer Mara De La Rosa, and our editors and sound engineers, Devin Donahue and Calvin Bailiff. <laughs>